does the Bible say about man? On Sunday, we were able to establish the fact that um, the, the Bible is the word of God, the mind of God, is the purpose of God. And we establish the fact that this is the very word of God. So anything we want to learn, anything we want to study, anything we want to know, we will use the Bible as the basis of our knowledge. Because we know that whatever the Bible says is true. Amen. So let's study man. Psalm 139 verse 14 to 17. We will read that and also a couple of other scriptures. David asked a question in the book of Psalms chapter 8. He said, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the book of Psalms is full of full of expressions of God's love for man, songs of Solomon. Um, even Ecclesiastes talks so much about man. But we want to look at man as God would have us to know who man is, his origin. Because there have been a lot of theories Charles Darwin, the Australian scientist, came up with the theory of evolution, that man evolved from the monkey family, from ape. Man evolved from ape. It, it, like a, a kind of a transition from the lower level of being to this higher level. And you hear them talk about the Homo erectus, the Homo sapiens, and all that stuff. But we want to discover where did man come from. Amen. Psalm 139 from verse 14. We will read to verse 17. I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret, and curiously wroth in the lowest part of the earth. Then eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, and which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God, how great is the sum of them. That is David talking about his creation as a man. And he said, my substance was not hid from thee. My substance was not hid from thee. When I was made in secret. Please underline that word made. When I was made in secret. And curiously wroth in the lower part of the earth. That's talking about the womb. Amen and amen. That's talking about the womb. Thine eyes did see my substance yet being on perfect. When I was still a fetus in the baby. In the womb. And in thy book, all my members were written. In other words, while you wrote that work in me, you wrote about my life from the beginning to the end. I said on Sunday, that if you, the Bible is the only book that can answer the question, where did man come from? Why is he here? And where is he going to? So here is David testifying that when he was formed in the womb, God knew him. My substance was not hid from you. Amen and amen. When I was formed in secret and curiously rough in the lower part of the earth, your eyes saw me even though I was unperfect. 
Amen and amen. So let's now look at Genesis 1.26. Genesis 2. Genesis 1 26, the Bible says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Are you seeing that? Genesis 1 26. Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowls of the air, and over the cattle and over all the earth over every creeping thing that creeped upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he, him, male and female created he them. Hallelujah. That was the intent to bring man to the face of the earth. So man is not a biological accident. It was an intention from the Most High. Let us make man. So man is a product of God's intention. God intentionally discussed, planned, figured out, and brought man into existence. It wasn't that God didn't have anything to do. It's not that God didn't have anything to do that he decided to create you. He carefully thought it out. Amen and amen. And look at how God executed what he thought out. Verse chapter 2. Verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life. And man became what? A living soul. Man became a living soul. Man became a living soul. Hallelujah to Jesus. Man became a living soul. Man became a living soul. That is the truth about the creation of man. It wasn't made in a lab. It was created by God. It didn't come from the moon. It didn't evolve from somewhere. Like some theories will have it. Amen and amen. It didn't just appear from the space. Man is a product of God's creation. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion. So it, it, it was God's intention to create man and bring him upon the face of the earth. That's how you see man today. Created by God. And when God created man, he made him perfectly well. Look at Psalm 8, verse 4. So the question of how did man evolve, where did man come from, should be led to rest. Because we have seen in Psalm 139, David said, I was made. Every product have a manufacturer, isn't it? So man was created by God. Psalm 8 verse 4. What is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him. Somebody say made him. Amen. Thou hast made him. Thou hast made him. A little lower than the angels, than Elohim. Thou hast made him. That is the key word. They made. Man did not just appear. Man was made by God. Hallelujah. Man was made by God. And God made him perfectly well, like I said. And breath into him, he became a living soul. Hallelujah to Jesus. Hallelujah to Jesus. Hallelujah to Jesus. Now, Let's look at how God made man, or what God made man to be. Genesis 1.26. 
We've read it before, but there's something I want to pick out. The Bible says, and God said, let us do what? Make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have what? Dominion. Man was created to have what? Dominion. Man was created to be in control. That is what dominion means. Amen. That's what dominion means. It was created to have control. Now, I want to say that man, as taught in the Bible, Is spirit, soul, and body. Man is not a spirit that has a soul living in a body. Man is spirit, soul, and body. Amen. We read in Genesis 2, where the Bible says, God made man from the dust of the earth and breathed into man the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Amen. Man became what? A living soul. Now, we, we used to hear, I used to believe, in fact, I used to say that man is a spirit that has a soul living in the body. But, like, I think it was last year, I said that theology is not completely true. The man is spirit, soul, and body at the same time. If man is a spirit that has a soul, living in a body. That simply means that man is a spirit and then the other two components of man should be inside the spirit being. But that is not true because spirit cannot operate on the earth. Spirit cannot work on the earth. Amen and amen. Spirit cannot do what? Work on the earth. If man is a spirit that has a soul living in a body, then we will never be able to operate on because the physical planet Earth was made for bodies, for beings that have body, not for beings that are spirit. Amen and amen. amen. Let's read Luke chapter 24. Don't forget we are talking about Bible doctrine. So whatever we read, we must be able to prove it from the scriptures, isn't it? All right, Luke 24, look at verse 30, uh, verse 36 to 39, maybe to 41. And as, as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that he, they had seen a, go, a spirit. Now, this is the, after the resurrection of Jesus. The disciples were in a house and they had locked that house. But suddenly Jesus appeared. And they were terrified because they said, Ah, we have seen a spirit. And Jesus said to them, Peace unto you. Verse 38. And when, and he said unto them, Why are you troubled? And why do you thought? And why do thought arise in your heart? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bone, as you see me have. Are you seeing that? For a spirit hath no flesh and bone. So if you are a spirit, then you wouldn't have physical body. Hello? If you were to be a spirit, then you wouldn't have a body. Check yourself if you have bones in you. That means you're not a spirit. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, so man is not a spirit that has a soul living in a body. Man is both spirit, soul, and body at the same time. Amen. With his spirit, he is able to communicate, to, to connect with the realm of the spirit. He's able to connect with God. With his spirit. And with his soul, he is able to deal with the earth. Feelings. 
emotions, hallelujah, with his body, is able to function on the planet Earth. So man is not a spirit that has a soul living in a body. Man is spirit, soul, and body. That's how man was created. Don't worry, in the course of this teaching, we'll talk about the spirit of man and the soul of man so that you will understand what they really are and be able to maximize them. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, let's move on. God created man like we see, we saw to have dominion. But something happened along the line. Can, can we go to Genesis? Let's go back to Genesis chapter 2. Verse 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. In the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Now, by this time, God has given man the tour of the garden. And he brought him to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he said to man, have you seen this tree? You shall not eat of this tree. Every other tree in the garden, I have given them to you. This one, don't eat of it. If you eat this tree, you will die. Amen. He gave man the whole garden, gave man the entire garden of Eden. And all that was in it, all the gold, everything that was there. And then he said to him, man, listen to me. Of everything I have given to you, one belongs to me exclusively. This tree, don't touch it. Don't, don't, don't eat it, rather. You eat it, you will die. Amen. Now, now, what does that teach us? You know, we, we, we have been told that we are under grace, so th there should be no do's and don't. That is not God. When you walk with God, there are do's and don't. God will bring you to a place of responsibility by telling you what you can do and what you cannot do. Grace is not licensed to freedom without responsibility. And so he said to man, this one tree, you won't touch it. I've given you the whole garden, but this one belongs to me. Don't touch it. And chapter 3 of Genesis, we'll read from verse 1. We're looking at the fall of man. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Amen. And he said unto the woman, Yea, had God said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now listen, let me say something here. The Bible says the serpent was more subtle. Now, the Bible didn't say Satan was subtle. Hello? He said the serpent was subtle. In other words, when God created the serpent, or what you call snake, he gave everything God created, he gave special abilities. Just like God gives some people talent. Somebody can have the talent to talk now and you laugh your heart off. And you could call them comedians. Someone else will have the talent to sing and when he stands to sing, heaven falls. Somebody might have the talent to play football and when he's on the soccer pitch, I mean, you will like him. God distributed talents to everything. Now, when God created the serpent, he gave him a special ability of being cunning. Amen. Now, when you look at the snakes in the world, so, sometimes when you see, excuse me, when you see these documentaries about snakes, you see how intelligent they are and how cunning they can be. God gave them those talent. He didn't say Satan was more cunning, no, the serpent. 
And now, what Satan does is Satan looks for people with special abilities to use. Where God has placed you and the talent God has given to you, Satan will come after that talent to use you with that talent to bring down the purpose of God. That's why those of you that are talented need to be very careful that you don't become proud and become an instrument in the hand of Satan. Because when you look around, you will notice that the people that always rise up against God, against the house of God, are people that are talented. People that feel without me, the church cannot go forward. People that feel without me, if I don't sing, nobody will sing. If I don't play keyboard, nobody will play. If I don't give, nobody will give. So when that which God has given to you, that is what Satan is always looking for. So he came after the cunning ability of the serpent. And the woman didn't suspect. Because just like demons can possess human beings and use them, that's how Satan entered into the serpent and spoke with the woman. The woman didn't know that it was not just the serpent speaking, that it was Satan in the serpent that was talking this time. She didn't discern that the voice she heard was not the ordinary serpent communicating with her. That there was something in the serpent that was talking. So what was the conversation? Had God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat of it. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. You see, this is how, this is how you know when Satan is at work, how he is going to challenge the very authority of God, the very word of God. Did God say, don't eat this thing? Did God say? He will make sure you go against the set down instructions. Hallelujah. That, that's how you know when Satan is at work. Praise the Lord. For example, a choir may decide that we are going to be coming for rehearsals by 5.30 p.m. And anybody that comes by 6 shall pay fine. And you come by 6, see somebody come by 6. And when you talk about the fine, you say, no, I'm not going to pay. After all, it was said by men. We are subject to mistakes. But you are part of the organization. And you know these are the established rules. The moment you begin to rebel against the set orders, of the organization, something is working in you to bring down the organization. Amen and amen. He's always challenging, has God said? What did God say to you? Tell you, no, that thing God said, are you sure that is what God said, that is going to heal you? Are you sure that is going to bless you? Are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? Can't you see the way things are? Can't you see everywhere is locked down? There's virus everywhere. Are you sure what God said will happen? I don't think that's what God really said. And some of us unsuspecting believers, we fall into that trap. May God help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Verse 4, and the serpent said, you shall not surely die. You shall not surely die. God said, you will surely die. And he said, you will not surely die. Praise God. For God don't know that in the day you eat the rock, your eyes shall be opened. And you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So my question is, were they blind? Your eyes will be open. Amen and amen. Talk about all that some other time. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Can I say something here? Nobody should blame Eve for eating that tree and giving it also to Adam. Because by reason of the fact that Adam collected that fruit and ate, he wanted to eat that tree. If he didn't want to, when the woman gave it to him, he would have said, why? God said, I shouldn't eat this tree. And you're giving it to me. He should have rejected it. But he tasted it. Why? Because he's always been longing. This fruit, one day, 
one day. So when the opportunity came, that's why you need to guard the desires of your heart. The book of First Peter says, guard up the loins of your mind. Because what you allow into your mind is a seed that is planted and you keep dwelling on that thing, you're watering that seed. One day you will eat the fruit of that seed. So be careful the thought you allow to dwell in your mind. That's what the Bible says, the word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. Don't allow things that if the fruit comes out now, it will bring you down from God's glory to dwell in your mind. Fix your mind on God's word. Fix your mind on your vision. Fix your mind on the things that God has spoken to you and where God is taking you to. Not on things that by the time the opportunity comes for manifestation, it will bring you pain and bring you shame. He collected an egg without even asking a question. This is, Bible says, she gave to her husband with her. That means Adam was there when the serpent was talking. And he didn't say no to the advancement of the woman to take the fruit and eat. He was there. Amen. It's not something that Eve ate and then went to keep for him to come back and then he also, you know, he was right there. Praise the Lord. That's why we must, one of the biggest way to get out of any problem, to deal with any weakness, to deal with any sin, is to take responsibility. Stop saying it's my weak point. There's no weak point. Take responsibility for your weakness, for your actions. Until you can take responsibility, you will never overcome it. Take responsibility. He took it and ate. And their eyes were opened. What? Or for what? What did God close their eyes from? Amen and amen. What is it that God didn't want them to know? Are you hearing me? What is it that God didn't want them to know? Don't forget the Bible calls that tree the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What is it that God didn't want them to know? Listen to me, child of God. It is not everything God will tell you. Are you with me? It is not everything God will tell you. There are some information that you don't need to know. There are some Bible says we prophesy in parts. It is only when we get to heaven that we will know everything. But for now, you can only know what God allows you to know. Even when God is giving you revelations, He will only show you in bits and pieces. He won't tell you everything. Knowledge puffs up. That's why in the book of Job, he says, then he opened their ears and sealed their understanding. God will not allow you to name it. When, when Paul was caught up in the book of 2 Corinthians and shown revelations that he couldn't talk, by the time he saw those kind of revelations, God allowed something to happen to him so that he would not be puffed up by the nature of the revelation he has seen. Because knowledge puffs up. So those of you that want to let God tell me everything, let God show me everything, God may not show you everything. He shows you what he feels you need to know. The, the, the thing God didn't want them to know was the fall of Satan. That is what God hid from them. And God didn't want them to get to know evil. God only wanted them to concentrate on the knowledge of good. Only wanted them to concentrate in fellowship with him and to know him and nothing else. Like Paul would say, I have made up my mind to know Christ and him crucified, nothing else. God didn't want them to know about Satan and all that because he didn't want them to focus their eyes on Satan. He didn't want them to focus their attention on Satan, but on him and, 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 and the work of the garden. But when they ate that fruit, they had their eyes opened to no good and evil. Oh, there was a problem and all that. That knowledge didn't do them good. And because of that disobedience, the fall of man came. Amen. The fall of man came. So let's look at the result of the fall. Number one, man lost the glory of God. 
Romans chapter 3 verse 23. Man lost the glory. You see, man was covered with God's glory. And the glory that was covering him did not allow him to know he was naked. Because when the glory covers you, it covers you from mistakes. It covers you from every deficiencies. Amen and amen. When you carry the glory, what you cannot do does not disqualify you. The glory is like, it is like an ability given to you to do what you can't do. The glory was a garment that wrapped them. But as soon as they ate of that fruit, it was a problem. The glory left. That's what disobedience to God does. You live without the glory. The glory left. And they became naked. That's when they now saw that, ah, so we are naked. But have they not been naked all our while? They've been naked. But they didn't see. When the glory leaves, nakedness is exposed. Number two. What was the result of this fall? Man lost his natural habitat. Man lost his natural habitat. His natural habitat was the Garden of Eden. <clears throat> amen and amen. The Bible says God planted a garden eastward in Eden and took the man that he has made and put him there. Eden was a special place in the garden. Eden was a special place. God made it specially for man. And in that place, he had put everything. Everything man will ever need to live his life. God packaged it there. The gold of Avila. Everything. The onyx. The, all the precious stones were there for him. And you know the, what that talks about? The presence of God. The presence of God contains everything. When I mean everything, I mean everything. In his presence, there is fullness of joy. In his presence, there is fullness. His presence. That's why David cried and said, Lord, cast me not away from your presence. Because in his presence, you have peace. In his presence, you have security. You have protection. The presence of God is the secret of all good things of life. Because where God is, everything is there. Are you hearing me? Where God is, everything is there. So he lost that natural habitat. He lost the presence of God. That means the presence of God is the natural habitat of man. Hello? The presence of God is the natural habitation of man. Number three, man lost dominion. Man lost what? Man lost dominion. You see, listen to me. Mosquito was created to suck the nectar from flowers, not blood from man. But because of the fall, mosquito decided to suck blood from him. No, his food was supposed to be the nectars of flowers, not blood. The fall turned them into vampires. All the animals were supposed to obey man. They were at man's command. But the fall turned everything upside down. Lions were not supposed to eat man. But if you see a lion now, even if you are 250 pounds, you will run the race of your life. Because that lion will turn you into food. Lion was not supposed to eat man. It was to eat grass. Amen. So man lost dominion over everything God had made. Because of that fall. Man lost dominion. Amen. He lost dominion over the earth and over everything God created. Don't forget, God put everything under his feet. But because of the fall, he lost everything. That's why Satan made a statement in Matthew chapter 8. Sorry, chapter 4. Let's look at verse 8 to 10. Matthew chapter 4. Are 
you in verse 8. Hear what Satan said. Again the devil taken him up to into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and said unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou will fall down and worship me. Did you see that? All these things will I give thee. Will I give thee? Will I give thee? Amen and amen. amen. All these things I'll give to you. The kingdoms and the glory of them. That's talking about the whole world and the wealth. Amen and amen. That's why he is God, the God of this world. Because when Adam and Eve disobeyed God and obeyed him, they brought themselves under Satan. Let me tell you the truth you do not know. Every time you enter a place that is not godly, for example, when you consult Sango, once you enter, he will the first thing he will give you instruction, remove your shoes. The moment he gives you instruction and you obey, you bring yourself under his dominion. That is why the spirit that worked for them are now able to access your life and tell them what is wrong with you. Why? Because the moment you obey that instruction, remove your shoes and you remove, you have brought yourself under. The moment Adam and Eve obeyed Satan, Romans 6.16 says, Know ye not that to whomsoever you yield yourself to obey, his servant you are to whom you obey. That obedience brought themselves under Satan and handed over the dominion that God gave to them. To him. Amen and amen. So, man lost dominion. The thing that we're supposed to obey man is now fighting man. Mosquito is the number one killer in Africa, isn't it? Number one. I think it kills every five minutes. Somebody dies of malaria every five minutes. Amen and amen. Somebody dies of malaria every five minutes in Africa. Common mosquito. Sings in your ears every night. <laughs> I'm still around. <laughs> amen and amen. amen. That is what sin did to man. The fall. Number four. Man was separated from the life of God. Man was separated from the life of God. Amen and amen. Please make sure nobody is sleeping around you. What life? You see, God said to man, the day you eat of this fruit, you will surely die, isn't it? That death was not the physical demise. Physical death is separation from the zoe, the life of God. Man was not created to die. Man was created to live forever. Are you with me? Man was created to live forever. But that act took that aspect of the eternal life from man. And, and, and listen to what God said in Genesis chapter 3. Verse 22 to 24. Genesis 3, 22 to 24. Are you there? Hello? And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, least he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way 
to keep the way of the tree of life. Hear me. There was another tree in that garden called the tree of life. Amen. You eat that tree, you can't die. It gives you life. And God told man, don't eat this one. All these ones are yours. So man chose the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you hear God say, man has become like us to know good and evil. That means the evil, the thing, the rebellion of Satan, God didn't want man to know about it. So because man had eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, God said, if man eat of the tree of life, he will live forever. And I can't have somebody in this nature to live forever. So God chased them out of the garden brought two cherubims. There are angels, there are cherubims, there are seraphims. They are not the same thing. Amen? They are not the same. They are different in ranks. Just like you have the police, you have the, the Air Force, you have the Navy. Are you with me? Uh -huh. that, 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 that's, that's for another day. So, so God brought two cherubims to, to guard the garden and then there is this flaming sword that was turning everywhere to make sure that man didn't touch the tree of life. Because God didn't want man to live forever with the knowledge of evil. When we'll be looking at the, the last destination of man, probably on Sunday, you will know why. Hallelujah to Jesus. The last destination of man the destiny of man, the future destiny of man. We'll talk about this. So the tree of man was guarded, man was sent out of the garden. We're looking at the result of the fall. Can you imagine what man lost because of that sin? Amen. This fall of man has affected man in so many ways. The knowledge of evil has made man to become evil himself. You notice after this time, Adam started having children. And the first children he had, Cain, Abel, Cain killed Abel. And then they had another one, Seth, and they kept producing, they kept reproducing, kept reproducing. And then you discover that the face of the egg was filled with men. Now, this fall, this fall, affected man. Can I show you something in Genesis chapter 5, please? We're going to read verse 3. But do you remember in Genesis 1, 26, God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. What was the image and likeness? That's, let our DNA be in him, isn't it? Isn't it? Yes. Now, Adam was made with the very nature of God. But after he sinned, there was a crack. There was an adulteration of that nature. Read verse 3. And Adam lived an hundred and thirty years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. So, what does the Bible mean by his own likeness? Because God said, let's make man in our image after our likeness. Let him be like us. But when Adam now started reproducing, it was in Adam's likeness. What does that mean? He passed on the sin nature into the child he reproduced from that time of the fall. So man was no longer the, the how do I put it? it? It wasn't with the life of God that God wanted man to have. That's why man can die. Because the man God wanted to make was not supposed to test death. So the fall affected man, man's makeup completely. That's why if 
a man has HIV and a woman has HIV and they give birth to a child, the infection will be passed on, isn't it? The child will carry that sickness. That's the same thing that was happening here. Amen and amen. Sin now became hereditary. Sin became hereditary. That's why the Bible says, it was in iniquity I was conceived. In Psalm 51, I was conceived in iniquity. I was sharpened in iniquity. I was conceived in sin. So we came into the world as sinners. So we are not sinners because we committed sin. We are sinners because we are born into this world. That's why every man must be saved. We are not sinners because we committed any sin. And now this sinful nature produces a lot of things. I'm going to mention three more and then we move on. We still talk about the result of the fall. Because of this fall of man, hard labor was introduced. Genesis 3, 17 to 19. God said to him, and unto them he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat the herbs of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Are you seeing that? For dust thou art. God said, first, cause is the ground for your sake. Every human being on the face of the earth makes contact with the ground. There's nobody that doesn't walk on the ground. Is there anybody? So even the ground rebels against man. Cause is the ground for your sake. He says, thorns and thistles it will yield to you. In the sweat of your face. That, 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 that's the reason why we have so much hard labor on the face of the earth. Suffering and pain. Amen and amen. Mm. So much suffering. So much pain. is the result of the fall of man. Man was not supposed to suffer. Man was just supposed to work the garden. But because of the fall, all these befell man. Amen and amen. amen. Because every sin must carry punishment. Are you hearing me? God is a God of justice, judgment, and equity. Every sin must be paid for. Every sin must be paid for. That is why Jesus, though sinless, but came to take the, the place of man, had to suffer stripped naked with crown of thorns and beaten. That was the payment for the sin of man. And that was to satisfy the justice system of heaven. It was just to satisfy the justice system of heaven. When God saw the punishment that should have been given to man, given to his son, he now opened the door of salvation for man. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So the reason for the suffering you see in the world today is not government. It started before government. It's payment for sin. And that's why we say, once you become born again, once you are in Christ, you must know these and stand on the finished work of Jesus Christ to say, I'm born again. This curse has no effect in my life. The work of my hands must be blessed. Amen and amen. Also the curse that was upon women. You see some women die during childbirth. Some women have so much complications during their childbirth. God had said, in sorrow you shall bring forth. In sorrow. In sorrow. That's in Genesis chapter 3 verse 16. And unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. 
In sorrow shall thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Multiply your sorrows and conception. So as a woman, the moment you give your life to Jesus Christ, you must decree and declare that this is no longer your portion. Because Jesus took away this curse. For curse is everyone that hangs on the tree. Are you with me? So you have the right to deliver children without complications. It's not your portion anymore. Can I hear an amen? Amen, amen and amen. amen. The other thing we see as a result of the fall is that man became evil. Can I say something to you? Man at his best is still man. Any man that has not met Jesus, are you hearing me? Any man that has not met Jesus and met Jesus his Lord and Savior, that man is capable of anything. Hello? Can I repeat? Any human being, man or woman, that has not surrendered to Jesus fully is capable of anything. Jeremiah, let's read Jeremiah chapter 23, sorry, chapter 13, verse 23, and Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. Jeremiah 13, verse 23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spot? Then may you do also do good that are accustomed to do evil. In other words, man is naturally evil. So don't be afraid when you see certain things happen. A human being will knowledgeably decide to be a problem to another human being. Amen and amen. I had a conversation with somebody yesterday. And when I finished talking, I just remembered this message. I wrote this message last week. I just remembered this message. An opportunity came up in the office for this sister to occupy. The boss over this sister now decided to go to the HR department to demand to be given that position so that she can occupy two positions in one company and deny the other sister the opportunity to be promoted. That is man. The heart. Oh God. Then may ye do good that are accustomed to do evil. Man is naturally evil. That is why you must fear man. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. What does it say? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately weak. It's not just wicked. It's desperately wicked. Who can know it? Somebody can laugh with you today. And the same day, what he will do to you will be unthinkable. That is why when you heard David in Psalm 55 say, he was not a man, he was not an enemy that reproached me. I would have controlled it. Neither was it the one that lifted up his hand against me, that spoke against me. At least, but it was you, my friend. We went to the house of God in company. Man, at his best, is still man, except that man has made with Jesus. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? Man, the heart is desperately wicked. During, was it the xenophobic attack of 2019? There was this video I saw of a man sitting on another human being and using a knife to remove the eyes in this nation. He was doing it. Somebody was videoing it. Man, the heart. The heart of man. Fear 
what is called man. A man, that is why sometimes I, 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 I laugh and I become distraught by the fact that we expect so much from people, even especially sinners. You expect the sinner to be good. That is expecting too much. A sinner cannot be good because they don't have what it takes to be good. Anybody that is not born again does not have what it takes to be good. It's not in them. The nature of man is evil. It's an evil nature. Except that man meets Jesus and is regenerated. That man is accustomed to do evil anytime, any day. Some of you say, when people have money, they show their true nature. No, that nature was already there. Money only reveals it. That nature has been there. Amen and amen. That nature has been there. Two people live together in the same house. Cousins, same blood. One needed money, didn't have. Carried his laptop. Gave to the cousin. Keep it. Borrow me money. When I return it, I take back my laptop. And the cousin took me and gave. And he took the money, went to police, and reported that the cousin who borrowed him money stole his laptop. In this country. Man is accustomed to do evil. That is why man must be born again. Because it is only a salvation that Jesus can change that heart. Are you hearing me? The heart in man. Oh, beloved. This morning, I received a message Somebody sent me a message, a video about a certain pastor. This thing happened in 19, 1999. This pastor, he just sent me a message, the man was preaching. But what I'm about to tell you about this man happened in 1999. He's a pastor. Some people gathered and decided that this man is talking righteousness too much. His own is too much. That they're going to make him stop preaching righteousness. So they, and what I'm talking about is not outsiders, church members. Are you hearing me? Now these are church members that this man has also prayed for. And they got blessed. When I mean blessed, breakthrough that changed their stories. But because the man will rebuke them for immorality, they will say, no, your own is too much. The only reason they didn't want to leave the church is because the anointing was working for them. So they said they are going to make pastor to reduce this righteousness preaching. You know what they did? They arranged with a sister. And then they called pastor. Sister Susan is about to die. Please come and pray for her. Pastor innocently entered his car, drove to sister's house to pray. As he got to sister's house, knocked the door. Sister opened the door naked. And the people they have arranged with camera were there taking pictures. How will pastor defend himself? It's only God in heaven. Can you see the heart of man? What they can do to the very person that is pastoring. So when you see the same people Jesus came to deliver, saying, crucify him, don't blame them, it's the heart of man. This man couldn't defend himself, but he told them the truth. But you see, picture speaks louder than words. But you know what the man did? He went to pray. He said, Lord, if you called me, defend me. Started fasting. Started fasting. Started fasting. Started fasting. After 186 days of fasting, God said to him, All these people that did that thing, they will be barren of every good thing in life. Those of them that were married.
married children died, started dying. Those that were in millions, they lost everything until they now sat down among them and said, look, what we did is what is fighting us. Let's go and confess. The heart of man. That's why even when somebody comes to church, you still need to know that man is man. It's not everybody in church that is born again. It's not everybody in church that is saved. Everyone that comes to church must meet with Jesus. That is the only time the heart can be transformed. Hallelujah to Jesus. Hallelujah to Jesus. He says the heart is desperately wicked. So there is an evil tendency. There's an evil tendency in every man. But when you surrender to Jesus, you see, I saw a quote on my sister's page some time ago. He said, bad habit is that area of your life that the Holy Spirit is not in charge. A bad habit is the area of your life that the Holy Spirit is not in control. Because when the Holy Spirit is in control, comes under the dominion of heaven. But the area that you have decided to be in control, that is where Satan will dance around. And that is where problem is also going to arise for you. Amen and amen. So man is naturally evil. There's nothing good about man. Amen and amen. Amen and amen. That's why you must be careful in your dealings with men. Number seven, number eight. Man became a stranger to all that God has. Ephesians chapter two. Ephesians chapter two. Are you in Ephesians chapter two? Look at verse 12. That at that time you were without Christ. Now this is describing the state of the Ephesians church before they met Jesus. Are you hearing me? At that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes we are far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Can you see what happened? They were without Christ. They were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Strangers from the covenant of promise. Strangers. Strangers. Foreigners to the promises of God. The promises of God. God as a God created everybody but is not the father to everybody are you i hope you know that in john i think john chapter 6 or chapter 8 jesus said you are of your father the devil that's talking to the pharisees god created everybody but is not the father to every he's only a father to those that have surrendered to his lordship so here he's describing the state of man before they met jesus you were without Christ. Strangers from the covenant of promise. The promises of God are for God's children. That's why as a child of God, you must learn to claim those promises. Claim those promises. Claim those promises. Claim those promises. They belong to you. They belong to me. They don't belong to the strangers. They belong to the believers. They are of God. Amen and amen. Belong to believers. That is the state of man. So let's look at the restoration of man. How did, after all this happened to man, how, how was man restored? How did it happen that man was restored? Genesis 3 verse 15, John 3 16, and Ephesians. Before we read that, can we read Isaiah 64, please? Isaiah 64 verse 6. I need you to see this before we talk about the restoration of man. Okay, Isaiah 64, verse 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, 
and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fail as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. You see, man on his own have been trying to, to, to walk perfectly before God. In other words, there are some people that have been trying on their own to be good, trying on their own to please God. Until you receive Jesus, you cannot. There's nothing you will do that will make God happy. Some people have built churches. They, you know, some people have built buildings and handed over to church in order to please God. That doesn't please God. If God has not received your life as an offering, there is no offering you give to Him that will satisfy Him. Your life first must be an offering, a living sacrifice to him. All the things people have done to find favor, see, all our righteousnesses, we try to be righteous, no, I try to do good, doing good won't make you good. It is receiving Jesus that will make you good before God. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. All the things we try to do to be good, to please God, except receiving Jesus into our life, it, it remains like filthy rags before him. So you cannot save yourself. You cannot help yourself. And every man must get to the point where they realize that I cannot help myself. I cannot save myself. I need a savior. Jesus Christ. I need a savior. Until you get to that point, then you will not be able to help yourself. You must see your need for a savior. When we will talk about repentance next week, you will understand why I said you must get to the point where you say, I need a savior. Because you cannot save yourself. You cannot help yourself. Whatever you will try to do to get to God will be as filthy rags. That's what they call penance. Here they give you punishment for the sins you commit. Martin Luther of the Lutheran Church was asked to climb the stairs on his knees as penance for his sins. And he used to climb the stairs. But one day he stumbled on the Bible. You know, I told you I would talk about the persecution of the Bible. There was a time Bible was not given for everybody. It was only the bishops, only. In those days, only the big bishops with big beards carried Bible. So the man stumbled into the library and saw a Bible and wrote that salvation is not by works, it's by faith. That is when his eyes were opened to see that all this punishment of going on stairs on my knees is not necessary. I only need to confess Jesus and believe him. And that's how the man did what they call protest. You know, we call them protestant. I said, no, what you have been telling us is a lie. What the Bible teaches is the truth. So they were labeled as protestant. That's when they left the Catholic to start their own churches. And they call them protestant churches. Amen and amen. amen. Only Jesus can save. You cannot pay for your How much will you pay? You can't pay for your sins. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's read Genesis 3.15. What does the Bible say? And I, the seed of a woman, will bruise the head of the serpent. Amen. That was the promise of redemption God made for man. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between her seed and your seed. The seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. Which shall bruise his heel. Then in John 3 verse 16, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish. Jesus is not just the way. He is the only way to the redemption of man. He's the only way. Some people say, no, there are other ways you can take to find God. Let them try. It's only through Jesus. No man can come to the Father except through me. No man, no man can come to the Father except through me. Jesus is the only one 
that can give us redemption from the fallen state that we read. All the things we read, man lost the presence, man became evil. I mean, all that we read, only Jesus can recover man and restore man. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So if you ever want to leave this state, this fallen state, and of course you know the end of this state, we will talk about it on Sunday. And on Sunday, I pray you don't miss the service. Because I'm going to show you the final destination of man. And when you will see that, I think everybody will have to speak to themselves and decide on which part of life you walk upon. So don't miss Sunday. Because we've talked about man, we talk about the final destination of man on Sunday. Amen and amen. Amen, amen and amen. amen. So this is where we are going to stop for today. But before we go, I want you to understand that Jesus is the only way out for man in his fallen state. He's the only one that can pick you from the pit of sin. Cleanse you. Restore you. Give you back that eternal life. And renew your fellowship with God. And bring back that presence into you. And change your heart. Hallelujah. There was a prophecy God gave through Ezekiel. Shall we read this prophecy before we pray? Ezekiel chapter 36 verse 24 to 27. Maybe 28. Please put it on the screen. Ezekiel 36, 24 to 28. Let's read it. Please let's stand so that you know that we are done for today. Amen and amen. amen. How many of you now know man? For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgment and do them. And you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and ye shall be my people and I will be your God. What I wanted you to see is God said I will take the stony heart away and put the heart. The only when a man has met and surrendered to Jesus can he have a change of heart. That's when that wicked heart can be taken away from him. That's why I don't want you to be surprised when you see human beings do certain things. It's their nature. Especially when the person is not born again. It is, it is wickedness to tell a sinner to stop drinking. A sinner must drink. It's his nature. It is only when that person is born again you can start teaching him the truth. So don't be surprised when you see a sinner drink, a sinner smoke. No, it's their nature. Hallelujah. Amen. It's their nature. Sometimes we try to tell people to be good who don't have what it takes to be good. Bro, you know that drinking is wrong. You are telling that to a sinner. Tell him Jesus first. When he is saved, he will know that drinking is wrong. Hallelujah. Amen. This evening I want us to pray wherever you are. The first question I want you to ask is, are you still the natural man? Or have you been given birth to by God? Except a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom. Salvation, repentance and salvation is where this change can happen. So you know yourself and you know who you are and what you are, what you are made of. I want you to start praying right now. If you are not yet saved, ask Jesus to save your soul. Repent of your sins and ask Jesus to come into your heart. And he will. He 
He's just waiting for that invitation. The Bible says, I'm standing at the door to knock. If you open the door, I will come in. He's at the door of your heart, knocking. Open up the door today. Ask him to come into your life. This is where the change begins. This is where it all begins again. Hallelujah to Jesus. So I'll give you the next three minutes to pray. And ask Jesus to come into your life. If you have not yet received him, this is your opportunity. Open your mouth and talk to him in the name of Jesus. Ask him to come into your heart. Ask him to forgive your sins. Your righteousness are as filthy rags. They are as filthy rags. There's nothing good you can offer to him the way you are. So ask him to come into your heart. Oh, ask him to come into your heart and to save your soul from sin and to deliver you from all unrighteousness. Only Jesus can save you. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come unto the Father except through me. Except a man be born of the water and the spirit, he has no life. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name given among men under this heaven whereby we must be saved. There's no salvation in any other but Jesus Christ alone. In Jesus' mighty name. I want to pray for you now. If you've taken that decision today, I want to pray for you. Hallelujah. I'd like you to stretch your hand towards me you're watching online, stretch your hands towards the device you're watching from. Let us pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you today. I give you praise, glory, and honor for everyone that is listening to my voice right now. I pray for those who have asked for the forgiveness of their sins today, that you will forgive them and cleanse them from all unrighteousness. You said, I will take this stony heart out of you and put in you a heart of flesh. And I will renew my spirit within you. Father, do that which you have spoken in their lives. Forgive their sins. Cleanse them from all unrighteousness. Change that heart of stone. That heart of rebellion. Put the heart of flesh in them. Put a new spirit in them, O oh God. Spirit that is willing to obey, spirit that is willing to submit to you. May it happen to everyone that have called upon your name in the name of Jesus. I pray that wherever they are, even in this tent, those that need healing, let them be healed now. Those that need deliverance in any area of their lives, let it manifest by your spirit. Those that need your touch, stretch forth your hands and touch them. Those that I need, you supply every need. Father, by the time they wake up in the morning, there shall be miracles all over. In the name of Jesus. Do what only you can do. Touch their lives and change them. Show them your faithfulness. In the name of Jesus. Be glorified, Lord. Thank you for hearing me. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Hallelujah. Please, don't forget to join us on Sunday. Let's take this study on man to the end. The final destination of man. That will be a blessing to you. Amen and amen. Alright, let's take our offering. Those of you online, God bless you. You have your offering or your tithe, the details are on the screen. We are open for counseling. Our numbers are also going to be shown on the screen. Here you can reach us. We will pray for you. The Lord bless you. See you on Sunday.